friends, welcome to this one day workshop on the art of acceptance. I might mention in the beginning, I don't choose these titles, but whoever chooses them does a good job. Because uh, acceptance, I have always considered, is one of the greatest techniques available to a spiritual seeker to make progress on the spiritual path. In a nutshell, one can understand spiritual path as the art of giving up mental resistance to God's will. If we accept His will, we made it. The truth is so simple. Sometimes I am amazed at the simplicity of the truth. If we give up resisting God's will, we will make spiritual progress. What it means is that we are not tackling any problem of His will. We are tackling problem of our resistance. And why do we resist? Because we have a strange kind of thinking mind, an ego, a haughtiness, a separation, an individualization that keeps us apart and wants to establish a separate identity from the single identity of a single universal consciousness that is laying out the whole play. We want to be separated from that. We are not actually separate. We never were. We never will be. The truth is that God is one and He alone exists. The rest is illusion. The truth is, if we experience consciousness, we are experiencing God because nothing else exists. The truth is that we are using a small mechanical device called the mind to separate ourselves even temporarily in illusion from that universal consciousness and this separateness, trying to have individual identity, trying to make that individual identity rich and wealthy, trying to grab things for itself. There are a lot of things God has given in universality. We, that's not enough for us. In resisting His will, we try to make those things our own. This is my thing. This is my car, my house, my bank account, my money. Who are you? Like that new character says, I am Bart Simpson. Who the hell are you? <laughs> it, it, it typifies how we think. Mine, my name, my individuality, my personality. Who are you? To separate is what causes all our problems and even the spiritual urge to find the truth. So therefore, if we can accept His will and live in His will, we made it. But it is very difficult to accept because the same naughty mind that is trying to persuade us to make things our own, to say it is my car, my home, my things, the same naughty mind keeps on telling us, how can you accept? Are you not submitting yourself to mind control? And what is God's will? Who knows? When I think in a certain way, isn't that, mind, isn't that God's will? Isn't mind created by God? Aren't thoughts created by the same creator? When some thought comes to me, doesn't the same God put that thought into me? Look at the kind of arguments you can evolve. And any number of arguments to sustain the power of the individualizing, separating mind, not the power of the single universal creator who gives us his will and which we can easily accept. So this mind, knowing and seeing with its own eyes that people who thought this is mine, this is mine, this is mine, died, left. We don't see them anymore. They left this physical world. They never took anything with them. All their life they were trying to make things their own. They neither took those persons nor did they take the things that they thought they were making their own. They robbed people. They exploited people. They cheated people. They told lies to make things their own. They did everything wrong. They felt guilty. They carried a heavy weight of conscience in their head to make things their own. And when they died, nothing went with them. And here are we still left to witness this. After seeing all this, we are still trying to make things our own and separate us from the general universal will. That's our problem. The art of acceptance. 
it implies a realization of the trickery of the mind and not to get bogged down by mind games. How to handle the mind is the first part. Whoever has been able to handle the mind has been able to follow the art of acceptance. In fact, one of the Indian masters, Guru Nanak, he said, whoever has mastered the mind has mastered the whole world and the whole universe. Just to be able to master this. One of the Persian poets, he gave in a simple Persian, I don't know if any one of you know Persian, that whoever can control the mind has performed the highest religious hajj or the highest pilgrimage that can be performed. If you can control your mind, you made it. The whole idea of these statements is that the mind itself is creating the obstacle towards spiritual path and nothing else. There is no enemy we have outside of ourselves. We carry ourselves, our God, our friend and our enemy inside us. The enemy being the mind. The mind that creates this separateness, this ego and we have to tackle it. Today in this workshop, we will try to explore what are the possible ways one can use to overcome the mind and whether initiation by a perfect living master gives us a way out of this impasse. We will go into that in a little while. The second part of the art of acceptance is to know what to accept. People have this problem. They say, it's all right, I am ready to accept, but I don't know what is his will. Isn't everything is his will? When I want to do something separate from others, isn't that his will? Didn't he make me to be ambitious and strong and independent and do what I want to? Isn't that his will? How do we distinguish? Where do we draw the line? What is his will and what is our mind's will? Assuming there are two. A person who argues like that, first of all, confirms that there is more than one will. The real will of the creator, director of the whole show, which he can't change and is going on relentlessly, and his will, which seems to fight against it and wants to create the individualization. So, in this physical show going on here, we can see there are two wills operating. And you might call it God's will on the one hand and individual mind's will opposing or trying to be defiant about it on the other. How do we know whether a particular will is God's will or it's our individual mind's will? At this point, I must pause lest some of you have this objection because there is a common objection that even the mind's will must have been set up by the same creator. That is true. The mind's will has been set up by the same creator. So has the whole illusion been set up by the same creator. We are talking of the illusion that is going on now, in which we are placed, in which this workshop is taking place and how to get out of it. We are not talking of the end reality. We are talking of the situation we are in. In this illusion, mind's will has taken a separate role and we have to deal with it at this level. Later on, we might find that the whole program of our getting this information, of our fighting out this will, of our going back to the ultimate will was part of the ultimate will. But that doesn't help us right now because we do not know. We are not at the other end of the tunnel. When we reach the light at the other end, we will have a different perception of what is going on. But at this end, we have to tackle in illusion the situation that there are two wills. God's will, which we should follow and accept to follow the spiritual path and the individual mental will, which our mind constantly urges us to go ahead with. <clears throat> How do we know what is God's will? Another mystic, Malana Room, gave the answer. And I have quoted it before. He said, people come to me and ask me, How do you know what is God's will? And I get surprised. And I tell them, when he has given a spade in your hand, he has expressed his will. Dig. What more do you want? When he has, the answer is so obvious. The answer is, when he has put you into certain circumstances and created the circumstances for you, he has expressed his will. Why can't we see it? Do we create coincidences of life? Do we create the circumstances of life? Did we decide where to be born? When these things are happening without our mental will, and they are already there and they keep on arising day by day. 
are there not enough signs for us what God's will is? That is why a person who can live in the will of circumstances and the language that these circumstances and coincidences speak is living in God's will. There are only two languages spoken in this world. The rest are dialects. English or German, these are dialects. The human language consists of what we create out of our mind and what God is speaking through coincidence. Have you ever noticed the nature of coincidence? What is coincidence? Coincidence is happening, synchronized happening of two or more things in such a way they look strange to us because they defy the laws of probability. The whole world is running on the laws of probability and something happens which is improbable. And if it happens second time, third time, wow, there must be something going on. This is not natural. This is not normal. Why is this thing happening again and again? These laws of coincidence are in fact nothing but the language of God. And therefore, one who can watch out these coincidences is really getting closer to the will of, of the Creator. I have often asked this question and got a positive response that as a person becomes more intense on the spiritual path, seeks more, the number of coincidences in his life increases. May I put this question to you? Have any one of you experienced that since you came on the spiritual path, the number of these strange coincidences has increased? For those who have happened, please raise your hand. Thank you. So once again, I am getting the confirmation of that answer which I have received in the past. It only proves that this coincidence is no coincidence. These accidents are no accidents. That the power that can create is the power that lays this up for us. Therefore, when we hear a voice of our thoughts telling us to do one thing, and coincidence tells us to do something else, to live in his will means to live by that coincidence. To be able to watch what the circumstances of life dictate and to defy the mind trying to, def to go away from it is the art of acceptance. Some people feel that the, what I am suggesting is too aggressive, that you start fighting your own mind is not peaceful enough to be in a mode of acceptance. That acceptance should be such a peaceful thing that you should be just sitting quietly and keep on drifting along. That is not acceptance. If a person is given a role and he sits down and he says, no, I don't want to do it. I am accepting. He is not accepting. If a role requires a very active lifestyle, and one is put by coincidence and circumstances into a very active lifestyle, and the call of duty is to do that active lifestyle, and a person sits down and says, no, no, I am not going to do that. I am in a state of acceptance. That is no acceptance at all. A person who fulfills his role in a very active way, in a strong way, is living the life of acceptance. Therefore, the art of acceptance implies that we understand what our role is. And that role is dictated by the circumstances and coincidences around us. When we look at these circumstances and coincidences, where we are placed, then we should know we have a role to play. That is why it is said, this world is a play. It's a grand play going on in a big stage. We are all actors. We don't look like actors. We don't feel like actors because we don't know where the audience is. Because we are also the audience. At least we think that there can be no other audience. We forget sometimes that the totality of our consciousness is the creator who is the ultimate audience. That we in our own totality are the audience. That therefore, the audience is at the same place where the act is going on. The audience is on the stage. It's a very modern kind of play, but set up right from antiquity, right from the beginning of creation. That all this consciousness in the form of different players who come on this stage perform their roles according to the script and the audience is also their own totality. So here we are on a play. If we can discover our role and play it successfully, we are living in acceptance. Supposing our, our uh, local, we have a hair cutting saloon, there is a barber there. 
he uses that little shaving thing in old style, you know, and he is constantly used to this. Supposing we make him a king in a play, in a town play, he says, I'll play the role of a king. I'll play King, uh, king Lear. And he goes there, King Lear, and he cries and he puts on an artificial beard. But in the middle, he keeps on doing like this. And he's, he's messing up the play. He may say, but I'm telling you reality. In reality, I'm a barber. He's still messing up a play. The art of acceptance does not require that you shout out reality to people. The art of acceptance requires you perform your role on the stage in illusion. If he's a king, he'll be a good king if he doesn't do this. But supposing he does announce to the people that, look, I am playing the king, king's role, but I have to go home because I've still got a few customers waiting. He's telling the truth, but he's not living in the acceptance of the role of king on the stage. Therefore, when we accept a role and we are on this grand stage playing our role, we have to play the role according to the script that we are handed down. Even when realization comes and we come to know the reality, to pr pronounce the reality and to announce it does not fit in with the role and deviates from the art of acceptance. A lot of people feel that this is uh, a, a, a contribution they are making to their role by also adding on a little bit of truth. No, you don't have to add on a little bit of truth. The truth is that you discover that you are not a king, but you are playing the role of a king. To remain conscious that you are a barber and not a king, but yet play the role of a king is the art of acceptance. To know that you are in an unreal world, to know you are an illusion, to know that your reality is something else, to know you are in fact an immortal spirit, and yet play the role required in this world is the art of acceptance. We miss out on this. In the old English plays, before Shakespeare came on the scene, there used to be small towns where people used to hold plays, and <clears throat> they used to have a very small fee. Something in modern times, you could go and watch a play for a quarter. You pay one quarter, 25 cents, and you could sit on the side and the actor would keep on telling who they really are. And they would also play their act. It was considered to be one of the cheap plays because the actors were not acting true to their character on the stage. As the development of character plays went on, people had to pay more money. You could still buy a ticket for 25 cents and go and watch a play where people were not serious about acting their own roles. And you had to pay a few dollars. If you go to Broadway, you pay $25, $30, $40, $50. And if you're staying in a hotel and buy tickets there, you may even pay $110. You go to the Phantom of the Opera, you may pay even more buying a premium ticket. Why, why did people pay more for a play in which the actor became the character rather than the play in which the actor said what he was off stage? That play where an actor could really play according to script was considered to be the highest. The highest quality of play was considered that where the actor forgot who he was and he thought he was what he was playing on the stage. Even today, that principle applies. We praise those actors who can really identify themselves with the character they are playing and play it so effectively that even we get taken in and think this must be that person. This playing true to character on the stage has marked the quality of the play itself. Now imagine that God, the creator, who set up the whole show, would he take a risk to set up a very cheap play for himself? He didn't. He put the players in oblivion of their own reality. And we as actors on the stage have not only forgotten who we were, we are playing only the role that we have on the stage. We have forgotten that we are acting. We in fact think it is real. It is not even acting. So the audience is very pleased. And this is a very good play going on because we have forgotten who we are. In the midst of this act where we have forgotten who we are and are acting our play, there may be some who are awakened to the reality that this is an act going on. That awakening that we are playing a role, this is not permanent. 
this just for 30, 40, 50, 100 years, we are going to go away. Where are we going? Where did we come from? This act was not there all the time. How did we land up here? What are we doing? Those awakened people have a chance to know who they were. When they find out who they were, that they were immortal. There is a temporary act on the stage. When they find that out, the pains and sorrows of the act don't affect them anymore. Because they realize it's an act. While the rest of the actors are suffering pain as real pain. Sorrow as real sorrow. And they are unhappy as real unhappy. The one with the awakened self is acting unhappy, acting pain because he knows this is not the real thing. So the awakened ones on the stage have removed the problems that are associated with good acting. And yet they act well. That is what is expected of a person who is awakened to the reality and yet follows the art of acceptance of his will and acts his role exactly the same as if he was not awakened. That's why you look at these great masters. They walk in our midst. They come and talk to us like ordinary human beings. Before we can ask a question, they have given the answer. And when we tell them, Master, how did you know this was in my mind? He says, what was in your mind? This kind of naive, childlike style of acting that they perform is an example for us. That even with all the knowledge, they prove to us over and over again how much they know. And yet in their act, they set an example that to accept living here, one should play according to the script, not according to the mind which wants to deviate. The mind wants to deviate. Mind doesn't deviate. Mind wants to deviate. The result is this desire to deviate is what causes the pain, the sorrow, the suffering that we face here, the unhappiness that we face here. We try to get something through desire which we do not ultimately get or we might get. What actually happens is the script. But this extra tension we build up in consciousness, in ignorance, that we have to do this, we have to try this, this extra tension, pain, suffering that we build up is a result of lack of knowledge and our ignorance of the reality. Even if we got the reality, we would still act the same way, but not have that extra tension or the pain or the suffering. So here is a way the spiritual path teaches us how we can live in this world and yet not be embroiled in this world. One of the big differences that takes place because of that awareness and awakening is we do not get attached. Attachment is one of the main reasons for our suffering. Attachment pulls us. Attachment becomes one of the greatest obstacles to meditation. Attachment becomes one of the greatest obstacles to seeking. Attachments, we create attachments and tie ourselves up. It is like this, we take out a rope and we tie at one place. Then we go see another place, we tie another place. We, with one person we go and tie up an attachment. Then we tie another. Then we have families, we have children, we have parents, we have brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, and we keep on tying up in different kind of relationships, some thick ropes, some thin ones, we pull and some break, some don't, and we tie up more and more. And when we are adults and are suffering with all, everybody pulling us around, and we are horrified by what has happened, we say, God, I am going to come to you now. And we want to go to God, and all the ropes pull us back. We close our eyes and sit in meditation and say, God, I want to remember you. And each one of those faces and those voices come and pull us back. These attachments are creating all the problems for us. And these attachments have been created because we did not take it as an act. We took it as real. When I say a thing like that, people ask me, are you telling, telling us don't love your children, don't love your relatives, don't love your beloved, don't love all these loved ones? Are you creating disharmony between brother and brother? between husband and wife, between father and son, are you crea creating divisions? Well, at first impression, it looks like that. That I have come with a sword to cut the, these attachments and these ropes. But I am not saying don't love them. On the other hand, I say that if you are attached, you cannot love. When you are detached, you will experience that you can love better than ever before. Nobody has really loved except in detachment. Love is not an attachment. Attachment is a mental experience. Love is a spiritual experience. 
Love is an identification. You will see the identi identification with another when you are not attached. When you are attached, you see yourself, the mental self. You see the other person, the mental self. You don't see the oneness between the two. Love is not attachment. Love is a spiritual experience at all times, at all levels. Whether in the physical plane, the astral plane, spiritual plane, in the ultimate reality, love is always a spiritual experience. Attachment is not, never has been. When out of attachment we tell people, I love you, I love you. Notice this scene. I have watched people saying, I love you, I love you. Do you love me? Well, say it, say it. Yes, I love you. There is so much assurance, so much extraction required to be able to get these words out. I love you, I love you in attachment. And look at the face of the person who is saying, I love you. That person you watch carefully now. And I have watched very carefully. Especially in this country where these words are spoken a lot. Because in many countries, in many cultures, they don't speak. They just have this feeling. But where this word is spoken, look at that person who says, I love you. That person, watch. I love you. That person who is saying, I love you, loves I more than you. Have a look again. That person is so full of the I-ness that I love you as if it is a patronizing thing. All right, you don't believe me? Test it out. Tell the person who is being addressed, I love you, that you should say, but I hate you. And the one who is saying, I love you, says, then I hate you too. What kind of love is this? It can turn topsy-turvy in so little a time. And haven't you seen such marvelous love affairs? We are in such deep love. And three months later, well, we, we couldn't carry on. You know, we, we were not made for each other at all. Three months, three days, sometimes ten minutes later. This is the strangest kind of love that we have. This is not love at all. We are misusing the word love to describe the small attachments between people. Attachments based upon their mental desires, not based upon spiritual love and truth that flows from within. That spiritual love is so different. It takes the attention away from the mental self. If you want to ask me one question today, is there a real remedy? Ishwar, have you really found a solution to the problem of the human ego, the human I-ness? And I'll tell you the only answer I really found was experience of love. It's only in real love that one forgets I and cannot use the word I. Of course, in the 60s when I first came to this country and told people that I love you, I love you is a mental exercise. It is not spiritual because in spirituality, if you really love somebody, your attention is on you. You are. Of course, when I said that a person like that would only say you, you, you. Of course, I didn't know this would lead to a new industry. Now I can buy a cup. It's, instead of saying, I love you, it says you, you, you. You can even buy posters now saying the same thing. But the point was not the words. point was that a person in love is identifying with the beloved to an extent that one can forget one's own mental ego. It's only the experience of love, that identification with the beloved, where the beloved occupies your consciousness more than anything else, that can wipe out and take the I-ness out of you. Therefore, don't mix up the two things. Love is not the same thing as attachment. Attachments are created and cultivated by us. Attachments are <clears throat> a crude way of substitution for love. We have love in our hearts. It's locked in, locked in because we are out. We are so much outbound with our minds and thoughts, with our desires and senses. The sensory apparatus is taking us so much outside that the love remains bottled inside. We are all full of love. When that love radiates, everybody is affected. It's not one person who is affected. Everybody around the person with love is affected by love. But the bottled up love makes us look for a substitute. And the substitute we have found is attachment. And the attachment is a physical and emotional, mental and sensory Equivalent of love, but it's not a spiritual activity. So the attachment has a great weakness that firstly it raises the ego, does not lower it. I did so much for you. What have you done for me lately? They always expect something. Expectations are built up to such an extent through this kind of attachment 
that lot of people die out of expectations not being fulfilled. People are expecting all the time. Expectations are one of the principal causes of misery in this world. When you expect so much and it doesn't happen, you get disappointed. When you get disappointed, you get unhappy. And this is a direct result of expectation arising from attachment. You don't expect something from somebody you are not attached to. But you have high expectations from people you are attached to. See, I thought he was so close to me, such a great friend of mine. I could never imagine he or she would do this to me. Don't you hear this? It's commonplace. I hear every day people talking like this. This is expectation. When you expect so much, you are bound to be disappointed. Therefore, you are bound to be unhappy. Now, why are we creating a source of unhappiness for ourselves? Because we don't love, we are only attached. These attachments are creating all these obstacles in our way and we are constantly using our mind to attach ourselves. Give up these attachments and try the other way. See, if you are not attached, can you still love that person? As a person, as a, as a child of God, as a creation, as a player on the same stage. Look at the people as players on the same stage. Try it for one week. Tomorrow, say this week, I am going to see all the people as if they were actors on the same stage, I am also acting. I am going to smile and talk to them nicely and see if they are as bad as they were in the last week. <laughs> everybody will change. In the next week, every person you meet will change. Try it out. I have tried many times with a lot of friends. That in one week, you go out thinking everybody is acting. There is no real attachment and they are all one. And you love them and look at them with this with the vision of love. How God created this big stage and put us in different roles. Look at them, talk to them like that. In one week, they are all your friends. They smile and talk to you they have never done before. And what have you done? You have only acted according to your script. Are we not supposed to do that? Is that not knowledge? When we get knowledge and accept the script, accept the role, the whole world becomes different and we enjoy this life. You go to a large park to have some fun. People go to Florida, they go to different places there, Disney World and Epcot Center and different places and they have fun. They have rides there, they stay in the hotels, they stay in, a, I, I see in a hotel where you can stay and the train comes right into the hotel lobby. Anybody seen that? And you stay in that hotel and we have great fun there. Now, supposing we went to that place and stayed in that hotel and we had great fun, we would enjoy ourselves because we know next week we are going back. But supposing we forget and we start decorating the room in the hotel and plant our trees, this is forever. We are going to hold it forever. And all the people we meet there, we are going to take them with us forever, including Mickey Mouse. <laughs> if we want to grab everything there and try to make it our own and get attached there, we will never have the fun that we have in Disneyland. Do you realize that? That the fun is there because of our knowledge. We are there temporarily for fun. Do you know this world is the same park? And instead of having fun in this world, we are making a mess of our life by trying to make it a permanent place to live in. We are planning for hundreds of years. We are planning what we will do and we will build these trees and these our generations will see and we will live forever and this is my home forever. And next day we can die. What is wrong with our attitude? We are trying to make a temporary abode into a permanent place and having forgotten where our permanent place is, we are thinking that this is the permanent place, thereby denying to ourselves the little fun we can have while we are here temporarily. This is a great fun place for those who know this is not their permanent home. You travel by train. I used to like traveling by train coast to coast, Amtrak. And <clears throat> beautiful. Run to the uh, lunch room, dining car and eat something, very simple thing, they only have very few items. But looks like that's great feast one is having. Because the train, one day we know we get off of the train. If I start making that my permanent home, I'll never enjoy the ride. It's the same thing here. We are making a big mistake in trying to make this small, short, physical existence on this planet as a permanent home. The permanent home is not here. So, if we can have some idea of the permanent home, which we can by going within, going within at least tells us that this is not our permanent home, we can correct our attitude 
and make more use of our stay here than we are doing now. The art of acceptance would come more readily when we have real knowledge. The art of acceptance has to be practiced till we have real knowledge. Real knowledge comes when we go within and see which is our real home. Till that time, we have to practice the art of acceptance of his will by watching out for the coincidences and circumstances of life. <clears throat> Having said this, I want to ask at this time that this communication that we rely upon, that we talk with, is of course very limited. I have given so many lectures here and so many workshops I have conducted. Many of you have come before. And so many of you tell me afterwards that you gave the answers to our questions. Of course, I don't know what the questions are, naturally. And so many tell me that this, this was designed for a specific purpose, for a particular person. Well, I, I couldn't gather all the ex others as extras for one person. But it, that impression goes to some people. Why? Because the communication we rely upon on the spiritual path is not always the spoken communication. Some of you write letters to me. I, re I receive them. I read them. I'm very happy. I feel like writing the answer there and then. And when I feel like writing the answer there and then, I can see that person receiving the answer. So I don't mail the letter. <laughs> I want to be sure you do get the answers. How many of you actually, actually, in, in real form, use telepathy to get some answers? Will you please raise your hand so I'm sure that the mail is working? <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. The, so do, what I am trying to see is to justify my not writing letters. <laughs> but you have the answer. I know what you've written, I know what I have to say, and you know what I have to say. You may be in doubt. Sometimes you get the answer, and you may be in doubt. Is that the answer, or am I making it up? Well, that's a very legitimate question. I'm getting an answer, but is my mind making it up? Or is it uh, really an answer that I'm getting? Well, if you think out your answer, you're making it up. Simple, same thing which I was talking earlier. When you think out your answer, then you are making it up. If you are not thinking it out, it is an answer. If the answer is not in your mind at all, but is coming on a wall poster, which you never expected to see on the way, it's not made up by you. If the answer is being told by Mr. X or Miss Y or Mrs. Z, somewhere you are going out of the way and you never, never expected to ask that question and that answer is coming from there, you are not making it up. It is the answer. But if you are thinking, now I know, I want to get this permission to do it. And I know that this is very necessary. I don't want to do it without permission. Now, mm, yeah, yeah, I should do it. Yes, <laughs> That's not the communication. That's not the answer. As I said, the soul within us, which thirsts for knowledge, which thirsts for love and thirsts for realization, is always able to absorb the answers that come spiritually. The mind has to think out its answers. What comes by thinking, reject it. What comes spontaneously, intuitively, by a hunch, by gut knowledge, accept it. I am making it very simple that intuition is reliable and don't get messed up with such strong intuition that you have just by the thoughts and contemplation of it, it may not be real. That's the mind working. So the mind can mess us up when the spirit and the soul is working even at full alert. So let us take advantage of the beautiful systems that we already have in consciousness. I used to sometimes talk to great master, my teacher, and used to wonder why he plays these little games. Why he plays such games? On the one hand, he can show miracles. And obviously, they are so obvious, you can't even uh, deny them. On the other hand, he acts like a child as if he knows nothing. How do you put the two together? It took me a while to see that there was a method in this madness. That this was the art. An art of teaching me how even with the highest knowledge, when you are on the stage, don't mess up the play. Keep to exactly the same thing. He used to say, spiritual wealth is so valuable. 
If you fly at night and see the lights inside when you close your eyes and you can see the thoughts of any person in the world and you can go wherever you like and you have seen your own past lives and you have seen the Akashic records of yourself and everybody else, pretend you know nothing. Absorb it, digest it, hold it within yourself. This is a personal spiritual wealth. It took me time to understand the value of this. That spiritual wealth is not to be dissipated in illusion. The realization that this is a stage, that this is an illusion and we have come to play a role in it. How can this be consistent with distributing any knowledge of reality in the illusion and dissipating it and then saying, oh, I was only sharing my truth. Sharing with who? It took time to understand that as you proceed to the realization of truth, however gradual that might be, gradually you are trying to know what the truth is. The truth is not to be dissipated in illusion. It doesn't help. How does it help? If you get truth and you dissipate it in illusion, you are throwing it where it doesn't matter. How does it help anybody? But then how do you help? You find another person who is a seeker, who wants guidance and you have something in you. How do you guide? Guide by answering the question as best as you know. If the person is a seeker, your answer will hit that person because you never decided to hit. Somebody who put the answer, question in that person is giving the answer. You don't take the responsibility of trying to teach and persuade people. You give the answers as best as you can. But don't base them on sharing a personal spiritual experience that you are gathering within, within yourself. Digest your own experience first. Build up enough. When you have enough and it overflows, then share it. Here are we, the little cup and we are waiting for something to drop, waiting for the rain and a drought. Drought is there, cups are dry, we have nothing, few drops fall. Wow, come on, I want to share with you. There they go. Let the cup fill up. When the cup fills up and overflows, let everybody share. And we have just a few drops of it, how can we start sharing? Therefore, when we have spiritual experiences, which are so unique, so convincing, so personal that they happen to us. Keep them inside. Hold them. Build on them. Some people get it in a hurry because they are keen to get some proof. All of us are keen to get proof because we have led a mental life for so long that when we hear there is some truth, some spiritual reality which we can have access to us, we always want proof. Prove this to me. Let this happen in a certain way, then only I will be convinced. True. We need proof. We do get proof. After we get proof, then what do we do next? We should hold on to it. When I got initiated first, and I said, if this master is real, then he can prove it to me without my having to tell him anything. I got late for, uh, for uh, catching a train at the station. I said, if he is a real master, he will delay the train. I went, train was late. I was able to board. Next time I said, yeah, I, I had to mail this uh, resume somewhere. If it is real master, although I am late, this will go quickly and reach. It reached miraculously in time. Third time I said, if he is a real master, he will know what I am going to ask him today. I went straight away, he asked me that question. Ten times it happened. I said, this is great. I kept on. That master stopped me. He says, what is your life? Just to seek proof? Haven't you had enough? Don't you think there is a next step after that? Or are you just going to play this game all your life? When you have got this proof, take the next step that you have to build on it. Go within. Get the real goodies that are waiting for you. Proof is to take the first step to know is it worthwhile. If you found it worthwhile, go along. But to say now I am going to lead a life of seeking more proof is to get into the trap of the mind once again. Therefore, I suggest to you that when these things happen and you get the proof, Hold on to it, build on to it, just by sharing with others, telling everybody this happened. Doesn't make the thing happen again. And then we wonder what happened. We, we can't empty out our cup before it is filled. Fill the cup, let it overflow, then you share with people and you will lose nothing. Now I want you to join with me in exploring that space which we call the third eye center. And whoever has been able to explore the space has been able to live the life 
of acceptance because that is where the creator sits. The creator sits inside us. We sit inside. We don't contact because our attention is all diverted outside. To be able to withdraw attention and sit where our creator sits is the purpose of this workshop. I have given lecture and people, some of them have liked lectures, some have not liked them, some think it is too radical, some think it is uh, wonderful, it has just answered all our questions. Some have said this is what we were thinking right from childhood in our own life and we didn't know somebody will come and say the same thing. All kinds of responses I see. But the truth is the lectures, to hear them, to be pleased by them and to go home and forget them, don't serve any purpose. The purpose is only served when we act upon what we hear, when we practice what we learn. And I would be no good if I came here and started preaching to you something that I can't practice myself. Therefore, we must learn and practice and not learn and just remember. Learn and practice. So this uh, spiritual path is a very practical path. This path does not say in the next life you will get proof of what you are hearing. This path says you can have proof here and now. The truths that the masters have shared with us are verifiable right now. You don't have to wait. Whoever is ready to practice and go within can find the truth. And the masters have said boldly from housetops, our truth is not meant for some people. It's a universal truth. It is not created by man. It is created by one who created man, who created human being. And it is inside the human being naturally. It is as natural as anything else within the natural body. This truth is not prepared by somebody and given. Everybody is born with it. We are all entitled and qualified for it. All we have to do is to go within and see the truth. To be able to go within is a, for a beginner a difficult task because we are used to going out. What has to go within is our attention. In this world, we can manipulate nothing except our attention. We can change the direction of nothing but our attention. We are sitting in this hall. Whatever is there is already here. There is a painting in that corner. It's a nice painting. Very modern, modern color. There is another painting of trees. Both are trees but different kinds. You see them on the two sides. If you don't pay attention to them, you don't see them. Did you see these uh, paintings of trees when you came in? How many of you saw them? How many of you didn't see them? The nays have it. The, the, point, the point is that you didn't pay attention so they didn't exist. What we can do in life is to focus our attention. When we put our attention there, we know it. When we don't put attention, we don't know it. The same thing is true of spiritual wealth inside us. When we don't put attention on it, we don't know it. Since we are giving our attention constantly through our senses and desires and attachments outside, we know nothing of what is inside. Therefore, what we are going to do now is to put attention there. How do we put attention there? It's easy to put attention on a painting on the wall because you can turn your head and look at it. But if you close your eyes, how will you put attention? Have you seen that painting on the wall now? Now all of you look at this, that painting on the wall. Have you seen it? Okay, now look this side. Now, don't look that side. Now, close your eyes. Can you still see the painting in the wall? Please raise your heads. Raise your hands, I mean. Sorry. Thank you. Please open your eyes. How did you all see the painting without turning your head? How did you see that painting when you did not turn your head? There was a majority seeing the painting, even much larger number than I had said earlier. How were you able to see that painting without turning your head and without looking at it without, with your eyes. Do you know what you did? You recalled, you imagined, you put your attention on the imaginative part and it came back to you. Is that right? Same thing you can do for going within. If you don't know how to put your attention at the third eye center behind the eyes, you can imagine you are there the same way. If you imagine you are there, your attention goes there. And the more you can imagine you are there and hold yourself there, your attention concentrates there. And if you are there, you see what is there. So the initial step is very simple. That if you imagine you are behind the eyes, sitting in the head, and that the eyeballs are in front of you, the ears are on the side of you, the head and the hair is on top of you, the throat is below you, that you are 
somewhere up there, if you imagine this space that you create by closing your eyes and withdrawing attention, the act of imagining you are there starts pulling your attention to that point and then you can see the lights and the sounds and whatever is there. Very simple. A small child can do it. And the great master used to tell me, even a small child can do it. I didn't realize till I grew up that a small child can do it more easily. <laughs> because small child is not trapped by the other things. Which we grow up and we put our attachments in so many places, it becomes more difficult for us. <clears throat> Let us see if we can identify that space. Some of you have done in the past. Is there somebody who has never done a workshop like this? Please raise your hand. Thank you. So, many of you have tried this before. The simple device. We sit upright in our body, on our chairs, or whatever place you like. Here, chair is customary. In India, we sit on the floor, cross-legged, but you can sit. Let me tell you in the beginning about the posture requirements. That people have sometimes in yogic exercises and yoga considered that the physical posture is of utmost importance. So much so that they have converted this yoga, which means union, which means union, oneness, oneness with the creator, oneness with truth. They have translated this word yoga into a way of exercising. But that's not it. The posture in yoga is important for two reasons. One, you should be able to sit in a position you don't go to sleep. Two, you should be sit in a position where you don't feel uncomfortable. Now, these are contrary things. If you become very comfortable in your posture, you go to sleep. If you are very uncomfortable, you cannot concentrate because the discomfort draws your attention. How to find a via media where you are uncomfortable enough not to sleep and comfortable enough not to distract your attention from the third eye center, that's the posture required. If you knew the principle on which these postures were made, you could find your own natural posture. But presently, for the time being, it is sufficient for this workshop that you sit upright, not too tight, not creating aches and pains anywhere, but not slumped in a way that you go to sleep. And sitting in that position, close your eyes and after closing your eyes, realize and be aware that this head is placed on top of your body, that in the head you are thinking, you are conscious and you are a being. And where are you? Try to figure out where you are. And if you cannot figure out where you are, then you imagine you are behind the eyes. If you can figure out where you are, you will automatically come there. But if you cannot figure out by your own introspection where you are, then you imagine you are behind the eyes. Stay in the center of the eyes. In order to make this exercise uh, more realistic, you can take a chair there with you if you like. If you want to imagine you have a chair with you, then place the chair on a floor at the same level as the eyes. Don't take it down. If you take it down, it will go, it will break into a sleep session and not into a meditation session. So to make it a meditation session, you must stay at the eye level. Now close your eyes, build the platform, strong platform behind the eyes, place a chair, sit on it, and do nothing but contemplate where are you, how are you related to the rest of this body and the ears and the eyes and the head and the throat, where are you located in relation to the body, contemplate on it for a few minutes. One, two, three, four, five, open your eyes, look this way, open your eyes. How many of you were able to easily locate the space which we call the third eye center behind the eyes where we naturally in wakeful state operate as conscious beings. Please raise your hand. Thank you. How many of you had difficulty in finding out where you are? Thank you. <clears throat> Those who had difficulty, would you like to ask any questions on the technique of being able to withdraw behind the eyes? Did you have any problem? Yes. Translate back to my middle of my eyes. <coughs> like vision was wandering. I couldn't stabilize anything. Okay. What was happening? I was wandering in my mind. Okay. A little more practice to resolve this. Anybody else? Any questions? 
Yes, yes. because uh, you were little below. You got little below. Uh, any other question? We'll do it again so we get the results. Remember, if we imagine we are at any place other than exactly behind the eyes, we go to sleep and have dream sequence. So this eye level is the level of wakefulness. Then we feel we are behind the eyes. When we imagine we are behind the eyes, we are awake. You shut your eyes now while I'm talking. You see where you are, right behind the eyes. You can feel you are still seeing right from behind the eyes. But if when you are sleepy, then you feel the nose comes in front of you and your level shifts. So to keep up there in this exercise, the tendency of sleep is so strong that in spite of our best efforts, many of us will go to sleep. If I go to sleep, wake me up. <laughs> this tendency is so strong that we have to imagine a device against it. Now, the device which I suggest is make a very strong floor now. Put some iron sheets on it, some real concrete. Imagine there's a very strong thump on it with an imaginative feet. Before starting the exercise, thump on it with the feet and make sure it is strong and you won't go to sleep. The second thing is that uh, the thoughts will take us away. <coughs> Random thoughts keep on coming because our mind is used to thinking all the time, 24 hours, day and night. So that practice of the mind to think all the time of one thing or the other won't go. It has never gone. In this exercise, the mind will keep on thinking. Oh, all you can do is to start thinking about what's going on here. When you start thinking about that, for the time that you can think of what's here, where are you? Is the floor there? Am I sitting in the center? Is this the center? When you put these questions and train the mind to think of that, the mind begins to concentrate here temporarily. It will still pull, other thoughts will come, but you can bring it back over here. You will also find that we constantly remain conscious of this body. Although we are doing an exercise trying to find out where we are, the thought continues to press on, we are sitting on a chair. We are just trying to imagine something behind the eyes, but actually we are in the chair. Supposing I were to say to you, where are you sitting in this room? You would be able to locate yourself exactly where you are sitting on the chair. Then you can see the walls there. You can see there are the walls, there is the ceiling, there is the floor and I am sitting in the middle. You have to imagine that this house, the body as a mansion, as a house is where we are sitting. You should be able to see the walls of this house. There is one wall, there is another, there is a top, there is a floor. Imagination should take you not to a feeling that you are sitting in the same uh, workshop hall and having an experience here. It should give you a feeling you have now moved from this room onto this room. This is the real lab, the real house of God, the real temple, the real church. This is what we have always known was the church. He never went in. So when you go in, remember to see at least what the walls look like. So don't merely sit there, look around. See, do you see the, it's a strange human shaped house, but so what? It is strange, but it is natural. We didn't make it. The architect or somebody else must be a good architect, you will find out later on. And you will see that this body is our home, that the body at the top part, the sixth floor. Like we take an elevator and go to the sixth floor, like that we can travel in the whole body. And there are six definite stages and we are at the sixth floor. I don't want you to go to the first floor and come up and say we have arrived. That is no journey to be on the sixth floor and to take the elevator, go down to the ground floor, come back, open the door. I have arrived. I climbed six floors. Well, you were already here. You just went down. The wakeful stage is already at the sixth floor, at the sixth chakra, behind the eyes. Stay there. And remember, this is the house. So, when we do the exercise again, Firm up your floor, explore it, look around. Look if you can see the back of this hall. Look if you can see the sides. See if you can see the eyes in front and the ears on the side. Turn around, turn back and then sit comfortably in the middle. Try again. Close your eyes and try this time. One. 
वन टू थ्री फोर फाइव ओपन योर आइज दिस वॉज बेटर दिस टाइम दो फेल्ट वॉज बेटर प्लीज रेज योर हैंड्स दो फेल्ट वॉज बेटर थैंक यू